national law would not intervene in this area. And this has been made clear in a number of cases. I, I'm sorry if I only have this in French, but you know, actually I should read this. It sounds very good. Sous réserve du respect des lois protégées par la Convention, chaque État contractant est libre d'imposer et de réglementer l'usage de sa ou de ses langues officielles. Basically, each state is free to decide its own official language. You agree with me that French sounds very nice, but, but yes. The court, the uh, United Nations Human Rights Committee, has also agreed uh, the same thing. Every country is free to decide what official languages it has or has not. But this case and other decisions in international law have also added something else. You can choose your official language or your official religion, but you cannot violate international human rights law. <coughs> ah, okay, so what does that mean? Does it mean that, is there any international human rights law really that protects languages? The answer is yes. It's yes, but it's new. And because it's new, most judges, most lawyers don't know about this. It has not trickled down to the legal profession very much. Lawyers and judges are rather conservative. Well, that's, that's a generalization, but the legal profession tends to be a bit slow in learning about new things. And when we talk about language rights and international law, this is going to be a slow process because, as you can see, most of the recent cases at, in international law that have recognized that language can be sometimes protected under international, basic international human rights. They're all pretty new, quite recent. We have things, for example, or developments, such as <laughs> Valentine versus Canada, 1993, not that long ago. For the first time in international law, it's become clear that language is a form of expression. I mean, most of you who are linguists know this for a long time, but lawyers are a bit slow. 1993, language is a form of expression. Well, that means that language is also protected by freedom of expression, facing private activities. That's incredible. That means that in all private activities, a government cannot stop individuals, cannot ban individuals from using their language of choice. This is a, a huge category of language rights. <coughs> 1993, until now, 20 years ago, Almost no one in international law would have said anything like that. Of course, you have no language rights in international law. It was not true. It was false. But this is a very recent development. The year 2000, only eight years ago. Now, this is extremely um, controversial. In 2000, the United Nations Human Rights Committee said that unless a, a state, unless if states authorities do not have reasonable grounds for not using a language in, uh, in administration, it could be discriminatory. In that case, I'm not sure I have a lot of time, but I'll just give a few examples. This is in Namibia, and there was a group of people who wanted to use, a number of individuals who wanted to use the Afrikaans language. Namibia, under the Constitution, only has one official language, English. Now, the problem in, uh, with the situation in Deergaard was that um, the people wanted to speak Afrikaans, and in fact, they could only speak Afrikaans. The government office that was answering the telephone, everyone in the government office could speak Afrikaans, but they were not allowed to because of the government policy. So here, the, the members of the Human Rights Committee looked at the situation, and they asked the government, um, they told the government first, basically, you know, when, you, um, when people can go to you for a service, this is the administration of government, people are asking for a service in their own language, that's a benefit. Um, if you are going to deny to individuals a benefit, you must explain it. You must have a reasonable justification. Why not use something else? Why only use English? It was a very simple question, but the government of Namibia offered no answer, said nothing. The government of Namibia simply said, English is our official language. 
Yes, so you're still denying to some individuals something of a benefit. You must offer a justification, a reasonable justification. They did not, and so the committee said, to only use English here is discrimination. <coughs> that is a, another revolution, because it means that the government, even though English is the only official language, has to use or has to do something against or not discriminate, which really means in this case has to use Afrikaans within the, within the government departments. This is rejected by a lot of lawyers. Once again, they're slow to learn these things um, because it goes against our, the, our paradigm, our way of understanding the relationship between language and official uh, language policies and um, discrimination. But this it has opened the door, and it suggests that in areas where you have a large percentage of the population that use a language other than the official language, where you have either a very large proportion or a very large number, government should use the minority language to the degree that is reasonable and justified in the context. And finally, there was, once again, another very recent decision, 2002, in the case of uh, <coughs> Cyprus versus Turkey, where the European Court of Human Rights actually kind of admitted that you may have, in some situations, a right to be educated in your own language. Now, that may sound very simple, but in terms of international law and our understanding of the right to education until then, this is another revolution. It's something that we simply don't quite know how to handle. But there are hints, as I'll be indicating, earlier on. So what we have here is a series of recent developments in international law that are based not on cultural rights, but on basic human rights law that have opened the door to a whole new understanding of the possibility of language being protected to some degree in some situations uh, in human rights uh, treaty law. What does, this all, what does it all mean in, in practical terms? The various declarations, conventions, and recommendations that I've all mentioned earlier, including uh, from the Council of Europe, from UNESCO, the United Nations, and the OSCE, they all tend to reflect similar values. So they're not written in the same way. But if you start dissecting or analyzing them, what you find really are values of what I would suggest values of tolerance, accommodation, and accommodation, rather than assimilation and discrimination. And they tend to recognize that in a modern democratic state, we have to be based on respect. And that means respect of the individuals and respect on diversity. And we have to actually recognize the centrality of language and culture and the respect of fundamental human rights, which includes language in other aspects of culture. And all of this is covered, or is it quite closely connected, to freedom of expression, freedom of religion, and non-discrimination. So what you have, if you look at the documents that have started to appear, really from the 1970s, and really has continued in Europe, but also internationally since then, what you have is a trend, a definite trend, towards agreement on the need to, to adopt constructive measures for the use of minority languages and respect for their cultures. And there is really a strong agreement on various elements or principles, approaches that we have under all of those documents. Among them, well, first is really the, uh, the concept that's fundamental to the approach of a democratic tolerant society is that states must respect the diversity that is represented by ethnic, religious, and linguistic minorities. And this means not just, or more than just, tolerance. It means, perhaps also where possible, promotion, as far as reasonably possible, and especially in relation to language, <coughs> which is central to all human societies. Because language diversity is really one of the most precious elements of our human cultural heritage. Secondly, um, it's pluralism, pluralism and respect for individuals 
means that linguistic, religious, and cultural preferences must be acknowledged and accommodated rather than ignored or even suppressed. Thirdly, in relation to the private use of language, most of the documents that I mentioned earlier, or those that really do deal with any kind of private activity, all agree that in relation to the private use of language, the basic principle is freedom. Public authorities cannot suppress or restrict one's private language preferences. And finally, the most controversial, uh, the newest of understanding, but the one which is also reflected in many documents, especially those that are not legally binding, is the acceptance that when dealing with the use of a minority language by the administration, by public authorities, including public education, the approach that should be adopted is proportionality in relation to a language use. I'll explain that a little bit further on. Proportionality, the use of language by government, by the administration of the state, by, by public, in public education. How do you put that in practice? Especially the European Charter for Regional or Minority Languages actually does suggest an approach here that's on proportionality by the government in the use of the minority language. Where you have public authorities at the national, regional, or local level, where you have a sufficiently large number of individuals who use a particular language, the authorities must provide an, an appropriate level of service in this language. For example, in the case of local districts and their administrations where minorities are consecrated, <coughs> concentrated, local authorities should generally use at an increasing level of services their language as the number of speakers of a particular language increases. Um, that's like a sliding, sliding scale uh, level or approach. The more you have, the larger number of individual, individuals you have who speak a minority, minority language, especially if they are concentrated in a district, the more of the services of the government should be in their language. And in fact, in the case of a very large percentage of the population that use a minority language, or a very large number of them that are located in region, then the minority language really should be a co-language of the offices of the government, or maybe even the main language of the administration in that region. If you have 10 million people, or 25 million people in some parts of India, who all share the same language, then really, the language of government should mainly be their language in that region. This is a sliding scale approach, the proportionality approach of language. Not all languages can be treated identically. It makes no sense to treat a language spoken by 1,000 people the same way as a language used by 10 million. Of course not. When we're talking about the use of a language by administration, by government, you must comply with a, broadly speaking, a proportionate, a sliding scale approach. That would be the approach in the documents from Europe talk about languages generally, and I would suggest to you, that's also the approach that would be consistent with the concept of non-discrimination in international law. Treating identically things that are different can be discriminatory. You, uh, you cannot treat everything the same all the time if they're different. How does this apply to China and Tibet? Well, let me first say this. Languages are often at the very center of struggles for power. That some governments exclude or disadvantage through language preferences. Even if there is no bad faith, even if there is no intent to discriminate, that even enough, uh, you may still have a situation whereby language preferences, we in effect exclude, remove, disadvantage individuals. By the way, this is not something that is unique to Europe or Asia or Africa. This is something that we find occurring in all parts of the world, really. And in many situations of ethnic conflict, you have these kinds of grievances, of problems. In other words, language is power. 
and the denial of language rights often leads to denial of opportunities, of power. Some of you may know this famous extract from a, the first, I think, di dictionary in, in Spanish, Castilian, by Antonio de Nibirija, who was the biographer of Queen Isabella de Castile. Siempre, uh, please pardon my Spanish, siempre la lengua fue compañera del imperio. Language has really been a companion of power for centuries, this is not new. But it is a power that advantages some and may exclude or disadvantage others. And this is not because some languages are naturally superior to others, but because governments have the power to exclude or disadvantage individuals through their language policies. And all governments almost automatically do it by having one or more official or favored languages. More than that, many governments or governments can contribute to the weakening of a language and disadvantaging individuals, whether it's intentional or not, through a variety of means. They can forbid even uh, individuals from speaking a language. And that's one way that this can be done. But it is one that has been uh, happily disappearing today. It could also be done by not teaching a language. Uh, this is an extract or a quote from uh, the French historian uh, Julien. Une langue qu'on n'enseigne pas est une langue qu'on tue. You kill a language. I'm not saying this for you, Gabriel. Uh, you kill a language if you do not teach it. But even if you teach a language, it's not enough to ensure that it will survive or develop and strengthen. A language, as long as a language has no significant prestige, power, and opportunities connected to it, especially uh, uh, then what is likely to occur is a noticeable, almost unstoppable trend towards assimilation mm -hmm. and eventual extinction of a language. And this is a phenomenon which uh, occurs in many parts of the world and is obviously still occurring. From a legal point of view, there is, of course, legislation in China, even legislation which is good, if you read it. If you look at what is written in the paper, it actually is not antagonistic to minority languages, quite the contrary. But the practice, the reality on the ground tells, or can tell a different story. Um, I'm not an expert on Tibet, and I, I can be corrected on this, but by and large, in terms of employment within the administration, whether it is in the Tibetan Autonomous Region or other parts of China, the proportion, proportion of the employees working in government departments is not what you would expect when you consider the proportion of the population, especially in, in the TAR. I have seen statistics, and maybe this is wrong, but I've seen statistics for 2003 that show that the Tibetans working in the administration of the TAR has been decreasing steadily in the last 20 years especially, and it is something around maybe half, let's say 50%, I'm sure that's wrong, but approximately 50% of government employees, broadly speaking, are ethnic Tibetans. In TAR, where the Tibetans are officially, if we look at the 2000 census, supposed to be about, what, 90%? Something around that. There's something not quite right in these proportions, isn't there? Contrary to what would seem to have been to the legislation that you have in China, the use of the Tibetan language, even in the TAR, is something that is something that is not clearly required. There seems to be, in fact, a language linguistic bias um, in relation to the language of administration. In, in practice, it would seem that Putonghua Mandarin is has become the main language of government. It is the almost the only language of university education. Mm -hmm. In secondary schools, I think in the TAR, all there are classes that teach in Tibetan, but there is in fact no secondary school which has Tibetan as the main uh, medium of education. Not a single secondary school in TAR. What do you 
would seem to have is a situation where a growing number of parents see that there is very little opportunity linked to the knowledge of Tibetan language. And most parents in TAR, many parents in TAR in other parts of China, see what is the language of opportunity? What is the language of power? It is Fuzhongguan. It is Chinese Mandarin. Because, and here I'm going to do a bit of theater. I only have a few seconds left. So let me suggest this. We were talking earlier about the functions in the uh, domain of uh, Tibetan or any other language. Tibetan language. If you say the language, the medium of, edu of education at the university level is Chinese, which is the case in TAR, part of the domain for the use of the Tibetan language is gone. If you say that the main language for secondary school language of instruction of education in almost all the secondary schools in TAR is Putanghua Chinese. It's no longer Tibetan. You're removing a bit more. If you're saying that it will be in the police force in TAR, you must be fluent in Chinese.